Hello, uh, welcome to my talk, Counter Expectation Concession and Free Choice in Tibetan and Beyond. The talk today is about this one expression in Tibetan, inang, which appears at first glance to have three distinct uses. So one is as the canonical translation for however or but, some kind of counter expectational particle. So for example, in example one, tashi gegende inang jangpo mindu. Tashi is a teacher, however, isn't smart. We use inang in this sense. Uh, there's also a use of inang as a concessive scalar focus particle. I'll talk more about what that means uh, a little later, but here's one example to give you a flavor of this. So telling someone, don't worry, the test is easy. If you read even at least one book, you'll pass the exam, something like that. And third, uh, inang takes some kind of WH expression and forms universal free choice items. So we can say, Norbu kara kare inang sagire. Norbu eats any food or anything. If we look at inang first and its usage, um, it also appears, uh, especially in writing, as inayang um, and also can be said that way. Um, also in casual speech, it's often contracted to this form, ine. Uh, morphologically, it quite clearly is in the copula, na, the conditional suffix, and yang, which is even, the scalar additive particle. That transparently is then inna yang, and contracted slightly is inang, which is the canonical form in some dictionaries, and I'll be following that uh, for glosses here. And then there's this contracted form, ine, and I should note that that follows a more general pattern of young uh, scalar additive being reduced to a in certain environments. So if we take this morphology seriously, um, that means that inang is something like even if it's, right? So today what I'm going to do is to document these uses of Tibetan inang from original field work that I've done over the past couple summers. Um, and I'll develop a compositional semantics which takes this morphology seriously, right? Let's try to see, can we really think of it as even if it's something like that and derive these three uses? Um, I think this is possible. And along the way, something that that requires of us is uh, it develops a new approach to universal free choice, in particular with the feature that it doesn't have to stipulate the quantificational force as being universal. Furthermore, I'll note that similar constructions with the same or similar set of ingredients morphologically with the same or similar range of uses is attested in a number of Dravidian languages that uh, Rahul Balusu has been working on recently um, and also in Japanese. So for example, um, just as we saw in Tibetan, we have this copula conditional even order together in Inayang. Uh, in Kannada, that's a Dravidian language. Um, we have, again, head final language. We have exactly that same morphology for uh, counter expectational but, a concessive scalar particle, and for universal free choice items together with a WH, but also for some other uses. Um, and in Japanese, we have this form demo, um, which is a little bit less transparent in its morphology, but it also is the way to express but, the counter expectational. It's also a concessive scalar, but also with an additional meaning, um, and also forms universal free choice items together with WH. So this type of cross-linguistic evidence also further supports the decompositional approach to the morphology of Tibetan Inan. In other words, taking seriously that these ingredients can actually compositionally derive this range of meanings, um, if we take that seriously, it's not surprising that then other languages would develop those same pathways as well, other genetically unrelated languages. Um, and so I'll very briefly discuss extensions of this and share some of this uh, kind of outlook at the very end. So today uh, I'll first begin with the counter expectational use. We'll get that sort of out of the way. And then we have a morphosyntactic aside. We have to talk about what it means when this expression takes some focused constituent or takes a WH. 
Um, and then we'll walk through the two uses, the concessive scalar particle use and the universal free choice item use, step by step. And then I'll close with those cross-linguistic notes. So let's talk first about the counter-expectational particle use. So when we say a sentence that is inang q, referring to a prior proposition p that someone has uttered, maybe it's the same speaker, maybe someone else, then it requires an expectation that if p, it's unlikely that q, something like that, therefore making q unexpected, and the speaker is committed to q, right? That's the semantics we want to get. Um, I want to first establish that counter expectation is required. So, for example, in six, uh, um, he eats a lot of food, but he doesn't gain weight with um, this is fine with that negation in the verb. If we take away the negation, right, and we end with um, he eats a lot of food, but he gains weight. Uh, that doesn't make sense, right? In the same way that it doesn't make sense for English, but or however, this is considered unacceptable as a continuation with ina. So here's a, a quick sketch of the analysis. Um, the proposal will be that inang takes an unpronounced propositional anaphore, which refers to this specific previous proposition that it's making reference to. And so then again, if we unpack that, uh, the morphology compositionally, then what this means is that a sentence of the form inayang q is literally going to be something of the form, even if it's p, unpronounced, q. What does that mean? So suppose that capital P is a set of relevant alternatives to the proposition P. So these are propositions P prime where the conditional if P prime Q are relevant to consider other situations that may lead to Q. So now even will require that the conditional if P Q is going to be less likely than its alternatives if P prime Q for all other propositions in capital P. This scalar condition requires low credence in if p q, right? It can't hold if if p q is particularly likely. It has to be less likely than all those other possibilities. Um, therefore, that's incompatible with an expectation that if p it's likely q, and therefore this utterance inang q is going to signal and reinforce an expectation that the speaker has that if P, it's likely not Q, right? And so using the scalar particle even, together with the conditional meaning, we can derive this sort of counter expectational flavor. We furthermore want to derive the commitment the speaker has to Q, right? This is a conditional. If it's literally something like if P, Q, that by itself normally doesn't commit a speaker to the consequent Q. So we need to derive that additional bit. Um, there are two ways of doing this. So one is via commitment to P. So in one sense, uh, a proposition, the proposition P was asserted either by the same speaker or it was maybe uh, posited as put forth by another speaker and not denied and therefore accepted in the discourse, part of the common ground. Now the speaker asserts if P, Q, and if the speaker believes, or if we already agree on P, then by modus ponens, the speaker is then also committed to Q. Now we also, um, I think in some situations, use expressions like this where P itself is actually maybe under dispute. Maybe it's proffered, but not agreed upon. And I think in this case too, we still derive this commitment to Q. Um, but in a slightly different way. So assume that the capital P then uh, exhausts all relevant possibilities that we want to consider. Um, this type of even if conditional is called by Bennett an introduced even if conditional. Um, and it's observed that in those cases, right, of the form even if P, Q, where the alternatives to P range over all relevant possibilities, uh, to consider there, then that form will implicate the truth of the consequent Q in the general case. 
Um, and I'm not going to walk through that here, why that is logically, um, but I'll refer to uh, this section in uh, Kai von Fintel's dissertation that walks through it, precisely how that happens. So what have we done? What we've done is to use a scalar particle even to build a concessive, although or even though kind of connective from a causal one, which is generally cross-linguistically common. Um, and then we use that together with a previous proposition that is already in the discourse to signal a counter expectation between P and Q. And this logic for uh, building this counter expectational meaning here, um, something similar has been proposed previously for uh, English concessive still in Ippolito's work, um, as well as um, in Rahul Balusu's recent work uh, mentioned previously on looking at the compositional semantics of very similar expressions in some Dravidian languages. Now we have to do a little bit of syntax and then we'll come back to the semantics. But we need to talk about the syntax of inang when uh, actually used in something like an argument position. So taking the morphology seriously, right? That's the enterprise today. Uh, it's a copula, conditional, and even. Um, inang is gonna be a copular conditional clause with even. That's what we expect it to be. So let's take a look at a free choice item example in more detail to see what kind of issues will come up then. So here's another example. Um, so Pema is someone who's very friendly. And so we say, Pema chukusu inangla kecha segire. Pema talks to any child or anyone. Um, here, uh, we have a couple questions that a structure like this raises. So first is, which of these are actually the arguments of the copular predicate, right? If we think that the in in inang is a copular verb, then what exactly is it relating? And second of all, notice here that the wh inang structure, that universal free choice item, actually is an argument position. And this is particularly clear in an example like this, where we, it actually takes a dative case suffix. Um, so how does that work? How can we have a conditional clause in an argument position? Let's deal with the first issue first. So um, at first glance, it's tempting to describe a WH free choice item, this use, as a WH phrase combining with inan, something like a, a which phrase combining with inan. But actually, this free choice item form doesn't actually take um, actual explicit which phrases in the language. So which is translated as gagi. Um, and so in a question you can ask about galagagi or chukugagi, um, which food or which child, you can't build this free choice item from those which expressions. Instead, what you do is you build them from simplex WHs. So I propose that the nominal part, if present, is actually the first argument to the copula. It's a definite description. Um, or otherwise you have a null pro there. And the WH word is the second argument of the copular verb. So for example, uh, these examples we've seen before, these structures, so we have things like gala gare inang for any food, or gare inang for anything. Um, I propose that that literally is even if the food is what, or even if pro is what. And similarly for 13b, jukusu inang or su inang. This means any child or any of them or anyone, any living thing, any human. Um, and that literally is even if the child is who or even if pro is who. And this logic also applies to the concessive scalars, their analysis, um, where the first argument will, in these examples at least, all be a uh, null pro. So again, now set, turning to the second problem, remember that inang, the morphology tells us this is a kind of conditional clause with even on it. But we see inang in argument positions as well. So here's this example 11 repeated again, where it takes a dative case enclitic or suffix. So um, here's an intuition, which is that these inang expressions are a clause which describe an argument which 
and it's sitting in that argument position, right? So in other words, this is something like a head internal relative or an amalgam structure. So an amalgam is something like in 14, uh, John is going to, I think it's Chicago on Saturday, right? So the sentence, I think it's Chicago, has a pronoun in it and it describes some referent and that is actually embedded in, it appears, an argument position in this English expression. Now there are various syntactic approaches to the syntax semantics of head internal relatives and amalgams, um, but many of them don't straightforwardly apply because to here we're dealing with very clearly morphologically a conditional clause. But one approach that does work um, is Shimoyama's anaphora, anaphora approach to head internal relatives in Japanese. So the intuition is that the embedded clause is at LF adjoined to the embedding clause, and then its surface position is interpreted as a pronoun that's going to be co-indexed in some way. So taking this example um, that we saw before, roughly in pseudo-English, this is Pema talks to even if pro is who, or even if the child is who, and at LF, what I'm proposing is that this is translated into even if the child is who, or even if it's who, she talks to them, where the pronoun or definite description, the child, in that description is going to be co-indexed with a pronoun, which is actually in the position that's interpreted for that expression. And then we'll unpack the even particle at LF was actually taking scope over the entire structure. It's just uh, a constituent particle, so it is an enclitic on the conditional clause. With those morphosyntactic preliminaries in place, now let's talk about the semantics and the compositional semantics of the concessive scalar particle. Concessive scalar particles are licensed in non-vertical environments and have a particular set of semantic characteristics. So Alonzo Valle says that they trigger a characteristic interpretation. They convey a strengthening effect in downward entailing environments and a so-called settle for less interpretation in modal contexts. And Chernich also notes that the concessive scalars associate with the lowest element on a pragmatically determined scale. So let's see how this works. So um, here are a couple examples from Spanish. Uh, this item, aunque sea, claims to be a concessive scalar. So give me at least a glass of water, you shitty doctor. Um, so aunque sea is associating with something low on the scale, right? There are other things that a doctor could give you, but you're asking for very little, right? You're settling for less. That's the intuition. Um, we can also have it in a conditional clause. So if you read aunque sea one book, you'll pass. And it's noted that, for example, if it's not the lowest point, right? If it's five books, for example, then this is ungrammatical. In addition, languages vary in whether negation licenses uh, this concessive scalar as well. So let's take a look at the facts for Tibetan. So in Tibetan, uh, inang is licensed in a conditional. So we saw this example before, tepchik inang lokna ikse If you read even just one book, you'll pass the exam, something like that. Um, if we change this to sum three, uh, this is ungrammatical, right? Or it's infelicitous, right? In very parallel, uh, in a very parallel fashion to what we saw with the Spanish example a moment ago. We also can license the use of inang under negation. So uh, there's a competition and you expect Tashi to place, um, but then you say, uh, Tashi ang sumpa ine le mindu. He didn't even get third place, right? Where well, first, second, and third place are given out, um, third place would be the easiest, the lowest pragmatically on the scale, the easiest to satisfy. You didn't even get third place. Um, if you did get third place, taking out the negation here just makes this seem ungrammatical or infelicitous. The use of ine or inang here is just infelicitous. Third, we can also see ine in imperatives, like this example, kalates inesa 
um, which uh, this, the context that my speakers and I were discussing is a context where you're talking to a difficult child, right? You're sort of pleading with them, right? You want them to eat more, of course, but you know, eat just a little bit of food and then we can be done, right? And so you might use an imperative like this with a concessive scalar, again, associating with the lowest point on the, uh, on the scale. So let's talk about how we can derive this meaning, um, this range of uses, um, and I'll be following the intuition of the analysis of concessive scalars in Lahiri's work on Spanish, aunque sea. So first, let's talk about the conditional case. So this is literally following the syntax we proposed, even if it's one book, if you read it, you'll pass the exam, right? And we'll also talk about the three case. Um, we're gonna get a set of alternatives corresponding to this that range over those different numerals that are focused. So if it's one book and you read it, you'll pass the exam. If it's two books, if you read it, you'll pass the exam, et cetera. Right? If we're associating with the weak element, the lowest on the scale, one, if it's one book, if you read it, you'll pass. Um, notice that this proposition, we'll call it the projacent, the ordinary value here, this is the least likely, right? This would have to mean that the exam is the easiest, right? So if you read one, you'll pass the exam, but also if you read two or if you read three, then probably you'll pass the exam as well, right? This is the least likely. This means that the exam is the, the easiest, right? Of propositions of this form. And therefore, even applying to this proposition with one is going to be satisfied. If we associate with the stronger elements such as three, even, you know, if it's three books if, and you read it, you'll pass. That is not necessarily, uh, it's not the least likely alternative um, because if you read one book and you read, it, uh, if it's one book and you read it, you'll pass. That is also an alternative to this sentence and that's the least likely, right? And therefore, Applying the scalar particle even is going to ensure that the associate, the focus associate of the concessive scalar has to be the lowest point on the scale. Let's take a look with the case with even. So here um, in this example, if it's third place, Tashi didn't get it, or even if it's third place, Tashi didn't get it, is what we're doing, unpacking this sentence. Again, in this context, there are three relevant numerals. So there's one, two, and three. So we have these three different alternatives of the form if, if it's first place, Tashi didn't get it, if it's second place, Tashi didn't get it, if it's third place, Tashi didn't get it, uh, missing a pronoun there. Um, assuming that getting first place is the least likely or perhaps the most noteworthy of these propositions compared to second or third, then not getting third place will be within this set of alternatives the least likely. And again, associating with three Third, the lowest on that pragmatic scale is going to satisfy even in this case. And this generally follows the logic of NPI licensing in Lahiri, um, Lahiri's earlier work. Um, now let's look at the imperative. So we're looking at a case like if it's a little food, you eat it with an even on top of that, right? Again, using our syntactic formula and unpacking the ingredients. Um, now, uh, if we assume that imperatives don't have truth conditions, right, let's consider that type of view, then we can't actually order this and its alternatives by likelihood or entailment. However, what we can do is we can use a scale like noteworthiness, which has been independently proposed as relevant for the interpretation of even in uh, Elena Herberger's work. So think about a context where we want to say a sentence like this, right? In a context where a stronger request, like uh, eat a lot of food, right? So imperative, if it's a lot of food, you eat it. Um, where that is also appropriate, it's also appropriate to tell a child, please eat this much or please eat a lot. Actually, the fact that you're asking for please eat a little, right? You're actually making the weaker, weaker request. That itself is noteworthy and therefore satisfies even. And we see then that this derives the sort of at least or so-called settle for less uh, flavor of concessive scalars in the imperative use. Uh, 
So to summarize this section, following Lahiri's work on Spanish aunque sea, the combination of a copula, conditional, and scalar particle even can derive the interpretations of concessive scalar inan. So now let's move on to the interpretation as a universal free choice item. Universal free choice items are items that are licensed in a range of modal, conditional, and non-episodic environments and lead to the universal free choice inference. Roughly, that is, that if you have an argument that's a free choice item X in a particular description, then it feels like there's a wide scope sort of almost universal quantification for any choice of X that proposition with the value X is going to be true. So um, because this involves a WH word, and interestingly, not as a question, we want to give a little bit of background on the use of WH words in Tibetan. So first, um, I'll note that Tibetan is WH and C2. So you can ask questions like, uh, um, Now here, we'll note that this WH word, su in there, um, cannot be interpreted as a bare WH indefinite, right? Even if we drop the question particle or something like that, um, it doesn't have a life as a indefinite. It has to be a interrogative expression. However, we can take a WH and combine it with some other material um, and form certain kind of quantifiers as is cross-linguistically common. Um, so in some previous work with Hadas Kotek, we investigated the conditions under which you can use WH plus even in Tibetan to form NPIs. So Dukpola uh, Suyang Lepmason is a grammatical way of saying no one came to the party. If we take away that negation, this becomes ungrammatical as a way of saying someone came to the party or something like that. So we need a story for how we can interpret WH expressions, both for questions, of course, but also for this kind of quantification. So I have a more general framework for WH quantification in alternative semantics that I've been developing. Um, and there's a talk online that I can refer you to um, uh, if you're interested in this. So I take the view that WH words have an alternative set working within a Ruthian alternative semantics where we have two dimensions of meaning. So there's an ordinary value for WHs, which is undefined, but WH expressions have an alternative set denotation with this alt, um, which is the set of values roughly that correspond to short answers, right? So for su in Tibetan or hu, um, its alternative set is going to be the set of animate individuals, let's say, or maybe human individuals. If we build a sentence based on that, like uh, Su came to the party, who came to the party, then because the ordinary value of the WH is undefined, the whole sentence uh, will have an ordinary value that's undefined. And the alternative set will be propositions corresponding to those individual alternatives. So the possibility that uh, the proposition that Tashi came, that Sonam came, that Migmar came, et cetera. And now um, here's one condition that we want uh, to always hold in this system is what, the condition I call interpretability. So to interpret some root node, some expression alpha, its ordinary value has to be defined. That's what we actually interpret. And it has to be an element in the set of alternatives. So the expression that we just built, that TP we just built in 27, uh, will fail this condition. If we want to actually interpret it as a question, we need to apply some operator. Um, we can adopt Kotex alt shift that will take that denotation and turn it into a valid question denotation. But that's not what we want to do now. We are not interested in building questions today. Um, we want to combine a WH with a focus particle, in particular with even. But notice that focus particles like even require its sister that it combines with to have a defined ordinary value, the projacent proposition. But if we're combining with something that has a WH, it doesn't have a defined ordinary value. To fix this problem, I propose a particular kind of covert existential operator, um, this exists operator in 27, which will create a ordinary value by disjoining the alternatives, um, but it will leave the alternative set denotation alone. It doesn't change those, so the alternative set will just consist of the individual alternatives. 
This is, I'll note, um, interestingly different in that second step from previous existential closure operators that have been uh, proposed for WH quantification, for example, in a one-dimensional Hamblin semantics, like in uh, Kratzer and Shimoyama's work. Um, in particular, using the existential operator that I just defined, applying that to the TP that contains a WH phrase that we saw before um, will not result in a bare WH indefinite because the result violates interpretability. Just disjoining and creating an existentially closed form as the ordinary value is gonna violate interpretability because it's not itself an element in the set of alternatives. The set of alternatives, just the atomic propositions. Um, but by defining an ordinary value, it allows focus particles like even to then apply and focus particles, as has been noted by Beck, have a property that I'll call resetting, which is where it lexically specifies the resulting alternative set to have uh, a singleton set denotation of just the ordinary value. So this allows for compositional derivation of WH even NPIs in Tibetan, as we saw, following uh, the Lahiri logic for enforcing negative polarity sensitivity through a scalar particle even. Um, and I sketched that process um, in uh, my recent manuscript. Let's go to the derivation of the universal free choice item. So in 31, we're unpacking the structure of this example we saw before. Pema talks to even if the child is who, or Pema talks to even if pro is who. We unpack this into the logical form in 31. So even if it's who, she talks to it or them, right, with these co-indexed pronouns. And we're going to put an existential closure operator, this covert exists operator as defined, um, just above the WH inside the conditional clause. Okay. So what does that give us? So we calculate here alpha. Alpha is the material that is in even sister. Um, that's going to be a conditional clause. The projacent value is roughly of the form, if it's someone, she talks to them, right? Someone, because we've applied an existential closure across the individuals in the domain of the WH word who, right? So that's just gonna be animate individuals. So if we apply a disjunction across that, if it's someone, then she talks to them. That's the projacent value. The alternative set will be individual alternatives related to that. Propositions of the form, if it's Mary, she talks to them. If it's Tashi, she talks to him. If it's Migmar, she talks to her, etc. cetera. Right. Um, so the conditional here, I'm gonna take the view that the conditional restricts the domain of a modal or temporal quantifier, right? This uh, Lewis Kratzer modal restrictor view. Um, and following, in particular here, for the imp uh, imperfective aspect, following uh, work by Areghi et al., um, I'll model, model the habitual imperfective as a universal quantifier over a certain set of characteristic situations, relatively normal situations. So let's take this meaning in 32a, the ordinary value, and think about uh, what that means, right? So, excuse me, we're not looking at 32a. I'm, talking generally about uh, uh, just the right-hand side, she talks to them. So uh, 33 is for all characteristic situations S, Pema talks to G of seven in S. Now we want to add the restriction um, that is introduced by the conditional clause, right? And here we'll introduce the conditional clause in 32A if it's someone. That's gonna restrict the domain of quantification over the characteristic situations. And I'm also gonna unpack this a little bit so that we're quantifying over pairs of situations and assignments. Um, so for all characteristic situations S and assignments G, where G of seven exists and is human, again, it's where it is in the domain of the WH word who, uh, she talks to G of seven in S. So that's the ordinary value. 
the alternative set is going to be individual propositions of the form uh, for all situations, for all characteristic situations and assignments G, where G of seven is this particular person, she talks to G of seven, right? Um, now notice the relationship between the ordinary value, the projacent here, and the alternatives, right? The projacent says for all characteristic situations, if G of seven is a person, she talks to G of seven. Versus the individual alternatives in 34B says for all characteristic situations, if G of seven is Sonam, she talks to Sonam. Or in all characteristic situations, if G of seven is Migmar, she talks to Migmar, etc. We notice that the ordinary value here asymmetrically entails every alternative, every individual alternative in the set of alternatives, right? That's a stronger proposition to say that if anyone exists, if any person is G of seven, then Pema will talk to G of seven. That's a stronger statement. Um, and therefore now when even applies to this whole conditional expression, um, this will be satisfied. Even will be satisfied because even requires that it's prejacent is the least likely compared to the alternatives that it's considering. What have we done here? We've done something actually quite interesting, right? Um, we've developed, uh, a, we've arrived at the meaning of the universal free choice expression, Pema talks to anyone. And there, we didn't have to specify the universal quantificational force anyway by fiat. Instead, the universal force of this free choice item came from the universal modal temporal quantification that is inherent in the imperfective following this existing work on the interpretation of imperfectives. Um, and that is then restricted by the conditional clause. That's all that we did. Um, but now we might wonder, okay, what if instead we had a sentence where we had a possibility modal instead, right? If the modal temporal operator is a possibility modal, we might expect an existential version of the same construction. So let's walk through that possibility. We'll see why that won't work. So if we have a, some kind of possibility modal, I'll just put in possible, right? Um, and unpack that meaning. Um, roughly, right, there is an accessible world where she talks to G of seven. Um, and now we restrict that with the conditional clause again. So in the prejacent, that's going to be uh, for all accessible worlds in assignment G, where G of seven is a human in the world, she talks to G of seven. Right. Okay, fine. Um, and then think about the corresponding alternatives. Again, the alternatives will be similar propositions, but corresponding to individual atoms in the set of uh, who. And so this is going to be sentences of the form. There is a world and assignment where G of seven is Sonam and she talks to Sonam, right? Or there is a, yes, that's a conjunction. Uh, there is a world and assignment where G of seven is Migmar and she talks to Migmar, et cetera. Um, notice here that in this case, the projacent alpha uh, O, the ordinary value there, um, is systematically a weaker statement than each of those alternatives, right? The ordinary value that we see just says that there is some world and assignment where index seven gives us a person that Pema will talk to, right? But the individual alternatives in uh, alpha here instead say there is a world where Pema talks to Migmar, or there is a world where Mi uh, Pema talks to Sonam, or there is a world where Pema talks to Tashi. Right? So here, the projacent cannot be less likely than its alternatives systematically, and therefore even will be infelicitous. All right, what we've done is to use the semantics of even to ensure that WH inang, even if it's someone, uh, actually always will restrict a universal modal temporal operator. If it doesn't do so, then the logical requirements will be such that the presupposition of even or the scalar inference of even will not be met. Now, 
WH enang can co-occur with possibility modals. Let's see what happens when we do that. So if, here's an example. Nyeki kala kare inang sa chokkire. My dog is allowed to eat any food, right? With a chok, which is a uh, deontic possibility modal. So here's what happens sort of schematically. If we have a universal free choice item, this WH inang with a possibility modal, uh, the logical structure is roughly as in 37A in some pseudo English. Um, following the, uh, if we unpack this uh, using the schema that we've developed, um, this means something like if the food exists, right? If it's something uh, in the uh, in the domain of what, if a food exists. Uh, my dog is allowed to eat it if the conditional is interpreted as a restrictor to the existential modal, the possibility modal allowed, then as we've seen a moment ago, the scalar particle even will not be satisfied. However, in this case, in addition to allowed that deontic possibility modal, we also have the imperfective aspect. And as we've seen, the imperfective aspect is a kind of universal modal, the kind of necessity modal over certain uh, situations. And so if the conditional clause is interpreted as restricting that modal operator, the universal operator, then uh, this will lead to a grammatical felicitous use with the scalar particle even. And what that derives then is this natural uh, result, this, re this uh, positive result, that the interpretation is a kind of universal free choice taking scope over the possibility modal allowed. Right? And we're doing that because the necessity modal itself is scoping over the possibility modal and we're taking advantage of the universal, the necessity uh, semantics of the higher imperfective operator restricting that with the conditional. That's how we're getting the universal over the possibility modal. We'll also note that WH free choice items with inang are ungrammatical in episodic descriptions. So here's an example. Tashitanda kala kare inang se tsarson. So roughly this is a, uh, a attempt at getting at something like Tashi finished eating any food right now. Without the uh, free choice item material, uh, this is, could be a grammatical sentence, but this is uh, judged as uh, ungrammatical by my speakers. So uh, the semantics of episodic descriptions he, uh, here are such that they claim the existence of a particular event. That is not a progressive, that is, tsar is to finish. Uh, apologies, that gloss is wrong. Um, so episodic descriptions claim the existence of a particular event. So here there was a completion of eating um, in the past because of the auxiliary song, um, but also we're specifying now. So it has to be in the uh, in the halo of now. So some some eating just completed, right? There's no modal or temporal operator here that supplies the universal semantics, which will then give us the right logical relationship between the ordinary value, the prejacent, and its alternatives, and therefore license even. And that's why the free choice item here is going to be judged as ungrammatical. Okay, so now we'll conclude with that cross-linguistic outlook. So to summarize, we've seen that Tibetan inang has three functions descriptively. So inang by itself is a counter-expectational discourse particle, uh, inang taking some focus constituent is a concessive scalar focus particle, and WH inang gives us a universal free choice item. All three uses I've claimed can be derived compositionally from its morphologically transparent ingredients. That's the copula in, uh, conditional suffix na, and the scalar additive focus particle even, yang. Along the way, what we've developed is a new approach to universal free choice. In particular, what's new about it is that we're getting the universal quantificational force parasitic on existing universal or necessity modal temporal operators that the conditional is modifying. Right? And we enforce that that has to be a universal quantification by the logical properties of the even focus particle. Um, 
I also have a firmer, further formalization of this uh, without the assignment function uh, quantification in this manuscript uh, that is available online. Um, and finally, I want to note, uh, as I mentioned before, um, that if this kind of semantics, if this set of uses is really derived from the indiv independent conventional semantics for the copula, conditional, and even, we might expect similar expressions with similar morphology and similar ranges of uses in other languages as well. And I'll first note that Rahul Balusu in his recent work has shown that this is true uh, in a range of Dravidian languages. So uh, here, for example, is this uh, form Telugu Aina. So I is a copula and Na is the concessive conditional, uh, concessive conditional even if morpheme. Um, this thing, ha this particle, this combination has three functions. So Aina by itself is a counter expectational discourse particle. It can take a constituent and be a concessive scalar or combines with WHs to be a universal free choice item. However, there's a subtle difference here um, in that WH Aina in Telugu can also be an uh, existential free choice item, something like somebody or other. Right? Um, and I'll refer you to uh, Balusu's recent work on this, on Telugu and other Dravidian languages. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to talk in the Q&A session about possible ways of extending the analysis here to these existential uses. Something similar happens in Japanese demo. So demo has three functions. It's a counter expectational, it's a concessive scalar particle, and it forms universal free choice items with WH. Um, there are also some interesting uh, and striking parallels between the uses of Tibetan inang and Japanese demo, which I include in the appendix to the handout that I'll put online. Um, but again, here too, it sort of, there's a slight twist, which is that uh, in addition to the concessive scalar use, demo as a focus particle can adjoin to a constituent and give us an, a meaning like, for example, another existential meaning. Um, and I'll include some examples of that also in the handout. So I want to end with one closing thought on constructional transparency. Right, how we should be studying expressions like this that seem morphologically complex um, and how seriously to take that transparency. Right? So for example, just to make this concrete, um, the Japanese item demo that I just mentioned is not transparently synchronically a combination of the copula conditional and even morphologically. Um, it looks very related but it's not something that can be productively formed. So Hiraiwa and Nakanashi, Nakanishi in um, some recent work have proposed that the Japanese surface form demo in, is built from the compositional components of a copula conditional even, so dea uh, demo, um, with a conventionalized contraction to demo. But this contraction is something that is idiosyncratic. This has to be something idiosyncratic about this item. It's not a productive process that can apply across conditionals more generally. And that raises a question. So when I posted previously about some of this ongoing Tibetan work that I'm doing online, uh, I received this reply uh, from Martin Haspel Math. Uh, a compositional analysis may be possible for some languages, but is it necessary? right, since it's not possible for all languages, isn't a uniform non-compositional story, the null hypothesis. Um, and I pushed back at this. This is not my uh, own bias as an analyst. I think uh, because these ingredients like WH and conditionals and copulas and even, um, these all have other uses in the language productively. Um, I think a compositional story should be the null hypothesis. That's what we should be pursuing. And then uh, in response, um, there is an interesting point that's raised, right? So how do you systematically distinguish, Haspel Math asks, between the two situations, uh, one, where, uh, one where it is actually productive and you know, synchronically transparent in the language and one where it's not, where it's some kind of calcified expression. It should not be 
analyzed. Um, and as he says, um, so Martin's suggestion is that um, when a pattern is productive, it must exist for the speakers. So I think this is a really interesting intuition. Um, so I'd like to claim, I, I without going into uh, how right or wrong uh, that bias is as well, um, I'd like to claim that even for the cases of uh, sort of calcified expressions, product, uh, not synchronically productive versions of this, um, I think we learn something by doing the decomposition for the Tibetan case where it is quite transparent. That is, right, the success of the compositional semantics that I've offered here for Tibetan Inang, taking seriously that it is the copula conditional and even, and deriving this range of uses. I think this is valuable for understanding the Tibetan, but also cases in other languages where it may or may not currently be morphologically transparent or not, right? So we might find other cases in other languages where the morphology and se semantics are actually quite transparent, and many Dravidian languages, at least based on Rahu Baus's work, um, appear to potentially be such candidates. Um, but also there are cases like the Japanese where the particle seems clearly calcified. It seems like it's grammaticalized in some way and it's not morphologically completely transparent. But what this kind of work allows us to do is it offers an explanation for why a language ends up with surface forms used for precisely this range of semantic functions why it bundles together one, let's say, lexical item for these uses, we can explain, potentially help explain that diachrony by better understanding how in a productive way, a language can combine these ingredients to form this range of uses, which could then subsequently be calcified and grammaticalized. Okay, all right, so that's that. Thank you very much. I have a question session on Wednesday. Looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you.